Hi, Randy Kay here. We all go through struggles at times, and I want to share with you through stories and insights and interviews with others how much God loves you. He loves you immensely, and that's what I hope you will hear through our interviews and what we have to share with you. Thanks for staying tuned. Here we go. Hi, welcome to this episode of Revelations from Heaven. My guest today, Linda Roby, she was on the operating table and she had a near-death experience. She went to heaven. But her life prior to that was kind of as a rabble rouser as I understand it. But she turned into a kingdom warrior from being kind of a rebel rouser uh, in the world. And her story is absolutely amazing. So uh, it's absolutely fantastic uh, to have you with us today, Linda. Thank you, Randy. It's good to be here. Well, Linda, you had an, uh, quite a quite a childhood and uh, rearing, and you wouldn't know it today, but uh, you were an entirely different person, weren't you? Very much so, Randy. I um, When I was young, my dad got killed by train when I was three. He was a state trooper up in Michigan, and <clears throat> it just seemed like, you know, when I was three years old, when I was born, life started hit me in the face trying to knock me down you know before I could even get started but um yeah he was he was a great man he loved us kids um he left my mom with uh three siblings my older brother was 17 my sister was 10 and my older brother was 14 months older than me his name's Steve and my sister's name's Debbie, and then my older brother's name's Bob. And he was my dad was on his way home to take my brother to the dentist, and he was in a hurry, and he thought he could beat the train. So that um, is the story in a nutshell. Um, so my mom, uh, my mom. The cops came to the house and my mom, of course, didn't do very well. And she called my grandmother, which was my dad's mom, to come and get us kids because she couldn't take care of us. And so um, before my grandma came to get me and my my brother, um, I was going around the neighborhood, knocking on doors, asking the neighbors, have you seen my daddy? <laughs> mm. And they were calling my mom saying, your daughter's here. She's asking for her daddy, mm. you know? And so my whole childhood when I was younger was void of having that daddy figure, you know, to, to love me and to correct me and to teach me and to put me on the path, show me the way to go, to be an example, to hold my hand, you know, all those kind of things. So uh, me and my sister really missed out on that. And my, <clears throat> my, I always had, um, as I, you know, as I'm thinking now, um, during my adulthood, I had, I always knew in my heart that there was something bigger, something something bigger than me, something, uh, just something that was out there that loved me or could love me or, and I didn't, I didn't, I didn't feel like even if there was that I would, that I could be loved, um, because I, I was just so bad. I was so bad. And, um, but anyway, after my dad was killed, we went to go live with my grandmother, me and my brother, um, Steve and um, my sister came a week later on the plane at 10 years old by herself. And then my brother, my other brother that was 17, Bob, he stayed there with my mom. And um, she uh, ended up selling the house and, you know, um, doing whatever she was doing. And in the meantime, me and my brother and sister were with my grandmother in Florida. So my dad was killed in Michigan. So while we were being raised in Florida by my grandmother, she, um, she was an alcoholic 
and um, she loved us to the best of her ability because we were all she had. Um, her, uh, my dad was her only son, so we were all she had. And so anyway, um, our lives would never be the same, you know, with without my dad. But my grandmother stepped in and she gave us the love that she could. And I believe, I believe that her love was God's love to me because she was just, I mean, amazing. Mm. But yet every night I would see her get so drunk, she would pass out in her chair. And that, and that was for years. That was, that was years and years for while she was raising me. She raised me from when I was three till when I was about 10 years old. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, um, I had been abandoned and I was, um, I was, I was just a, a lonely little girl, you know, and I needed attention. And so I was, I had developed friendships around my neighborhood and um, I was pretty, pretty much a little, uh, I guess you could say, um, I was a little bit of a wild child. Um, I didn't get along with all the kids. I was kind of a bully and I picked on some of them. And I remember this uh, this one family. They had three girls in their in their family, and um, I used to. It would rain, and I would I would dare them to come out. Um, I would put their bikes in the street and dare them to come out to get their bikes, so I could, you know, scare them or beat them up. And they were so scared of me. Their parents wouldn't let them hang around with me. I was so mean, <laughs> mm. and I mean. It's not funny, but I look back now and I just think of how, what a little stinker I was and how I used to get in so much trouble. And, you know, it was intentional. It was for intention. And so, um, you know, I just was with my grandmother and both my parents had abandoned me, my mom, my dad. Um, I was with my brother and my sister and my grandmother, and uh, she did the best she could to raise me and get me through. And then um, that was when the alcohol was subjected to me, uh, me seeing her drink every day, um, struck up my curiosity and I started taking, I started taking her booze and, and in drinking at the age of like nine years old. <laughs> oh and um, so that was the start of my downfall, so to speak. Then when my mom came to get me, um, there was a fight between them two, my grandmother and my mom. And I remember it was like two o'clock in the morning, my mom, you know, yanking me out of my grandmother's arms and put me in the back of her old station wagon and then taking us to this house that she had rented in this little town. Um, she had remarried um, uh, my stepdad, Frankie. He was a great guy. He loved us. Um, but the, the place that my mom took us to, we went from, uh, I went from my grandmother having money to my mom not having much. And so we, me and my brother, we, you know, we, we endured. And, um, then my sister was born my amazing little, beautiful little China doll sister. And I remember hmm. I was 10 blocks from school and I remember running home 10 blocks. I used to walk to school every day. And I used, I remember running back, running 10 blocks home from school to see her when she was born, just to hold her and, and just to see, she was just such a beautiful little China doll and what she has now become like my best friend, my, she's like my champion. She's 
you know, her words are just always encouraging and she's just been there for me and through, you know, through it all. And um, so she was raised in a different, little different of a time frame than I was. And um, she had a little bit of a different life. So um, we weren't always together, even though we did live together at times um, when I was, when I was at my mom's house. Um, so anyway, that's just a little bit about my childhood. And, uh, when I went, when I was living with my mom, um, things really, really took a chain change for the worst. Um, my mom ended up getting a, a divorce from my stepdad, Frankie, and me and my sister ended up taken care of kind of taking care of my little sister Diana you know kind of raising her because my mom my mom had to get a job and she got a job in a bar and she was gone like 14 hours a day and um she was like a real tough you know real tough woman from West Virginia she was she was born and raised in in West Virginia and her dad was a uh coal miner so she was a coal miner's daughter Mm -hmm. And, um, she really didn't know how to discipline me because she was abused. So that's a little bit of my story. Yeah. So you're in, entering into this space, um, having suffered th from the trauma of losing your father at an early age to an accident, a train accident okay. to, um, uh, facing the alcoholism of, um, you know, and within your family, the adults, uh, that were in your family. And so you had, you had become kind of angered by it all. And, uh, and you get caught into this bullying of, of some of the children, uh, to kind of vent that anger. So, uh, at this point, uh, what was God to you? Uh, was he, Linda, was he, was he at all present in your life? Was he an afterthought? Was he a no thought to you? Uh, how did you think of God? Well, my grandmother took us to church. She took us to Sunday school. So I had the Sunday school experience in my life. Um, she didn't sit with us. She just took us and dropped us off. And we would go to Sunday school and she'd pick us up. So I know without a shadow of a doubt, because it was a little Baptist church, I know without a shadow of doubt, they taught me about Jesus. I just don't remember because I was so young. I don't remember the instructional part of it or anything like that. You know, um, I know that his name was in my heart. I know that it was the, the seed was planted at a very young age. And then, um, God to me um, was, well, I didn't really know that I knew that he was, I knew that he was big. That's how I saw he was big and I was scared. I was scared of him. So I felt like I didn't want to, I didn't want to talk to a God that I was scared of because I was afraid because I wasn't living right. I knew inside I wasn't living right. You know, I knew inside I was, I wasn't living right, but I didn't care. But if I acknowledged that, that there was a God that I would have to change and I didn't know how to change. And, and, um, I, I was not ready. So I just never really thought, I never really thought gave God too much of my thought at all until like I was in a crisis. Um, and, and then not even then only just, a, just a couple times that I can remember. And then after that, he started, I started getting more thoughts, you know, more things came into my life, um, started coming into my life to, um, just plant little seeds, plant little seeds, plant little seeds. Like my great, uh, my mom's mom, my Nana Ruth, um, when we would go over to her house, she was a Christian. She was a Southern Baptist and she used to, um, <laughs> she had a, she had a bad, she kind of had a bad temper and, 
and um, she would uh, chase my cousin. He would run in his room and uh, then she would start talking to me. And I, I was like, I, I tried to be respectful, but then she would start talking about, you know, um, the Lord, the Lord is going to get you and you're going to, you know, and these kind of things. And then I would run from her. So I would run and, you know, not listen, but the words that she said to me that were biblical, you know, those were seeds too. So the, this all, it was all part of God's plan just to keep planting his seeds, planting his seeds, no matter where I was, no matter what I was doing, no matter, um, you know, no matter what I was thinking, um, he was always there. I just didn't know it. He was, he's, God is omnipotent. That means he's everywhere. He's all knowing. And I didn't know these things until I came to know him. And uh, there's a little bit more of my story that has, has been a big part of bringing me, um, bringing me to know him too, was, uh, I was in, I was involved in a very abusive relationship. It didn't start out abusive. Um, I met this guy at a game room at a young age when I was maybe like 12 and, um, the game room was right down the street from my house. Um, when I lived with my mom in a trailer park and, um, uh, and I won't mention his name, but he had a car and he liked me and I liked him. I thought he was cute. And, um, so, um, we started seeing each other and, um, we started dating and we went to drive in movies and we just had fun and hung out with friends and things like that. And, um, in the first year, everything was great. Um, you know, we had, we had, we had a good relationship and I was in love. Right. <laughs> and, um, then he started getting involved in drugs and, um, he started, uh, getting really heavy into drugs. And that's when I started them too. And, um, you know, that was just the, the beginning of the drug life that, led me down 90 miles of rough road and um everything just started spinning out of control from there when i started doing drugs and then he started abusing me and he would beat me um he would drag me down the road and um he was very 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 mean and abusive and very jealous and possessive mm. and um there were times when I was with him that I did cry out to God, but I didn't leave him because I was scared because he would threaten to kill me and he threatened to burn down my mom's house and things like that, you know? So mm. I just would stay because I was scared, but I didn't love him. I didn't love him. I was scared of him. And you were 12 at the time and he was how old? He was... 18. Okay. So that's. Or 17. Yeah. Something like that. He was driving. Yeah. Very serious. So he got you involved in drugs and a very abusive relationship. One that uh, you know, an eight, 17, 18 year old shouldn't be having with a 12 year old, obviously. And um, so yeah. at this point you're, you're going from, you know, um, an alcohol abusive um, household to now a fully abusive relationship that is frightening you. And at the same time, you're thinking that God is angry at you. We were on the streets doing drugs and um, we were in and out of his mom and dad own mobile homes that they used to rent to, uh, to uh, Mexican fruit pickers when they would come in season. And when they were not there, we would go into the the vacant, um, empty 
like run down trailers with no electricity to do our drugs. And um, so it just was really bad. And, and uh, <clears throat> I started when um, my mom would want me to come home and I would fight with her and she would call the, she would call the police on me to get me away from him. And then they would come and pick me up and take me to the juvenile home. And then I would go back home with my mom and run away again. So I became a runaway and, um, and just was in and out, in and out of juvenile home and trouble and, you know, uh, doing all the things that I wasn't supposed to be doing and, um, getting involved with just getting deeper and deeper into, into, um, just getting deeper and deeper into, into things that I had no business getting, getting myself into. Um, so the day came, um, I was 16 years old and I still remember, um, when I was 16, the night before, um, the night before this happened, what I'm going to tell you was, um, the, um, me and Billy were in a store and there was a, um, um, there was a Spanish guy that said hi to me and he must've gotten my name through my mom working in a Spanish bar because I did not know him. And my boyfriend heard him say hi to me and became highly, highly, highly angry. And so I didn't want to get in the car with them because I knew what was going to happen, but I had to get in the car with him because I didn't want to show a scene. And so um, I got in the car with them and we were on our way back to the place, one of the places we were staying. Um, and we were arguing and fighting and he had traded some drugs for a gun and he kept the gun in the, console of his car he drove a trans am his mom bought him a trans am um which was different than the other car that he had and um he had a big mural on it that said gray ghost you know and and he thought he was so cool and everything back then and um so anyway we were going to this house where we were staying and he drugged me literally i didn't want to get out of the car i locked the door and he came around to my side he took the gun out of the console and he said, um, he said, get out. And we, we argued and fought. And then finally I got out of the car and he grabbed me and he drugged me in the house and threw me on the couch and pointed the gun to my head and said, um, said, I'm going to kill you. And, and I just looked straight at him and I said, I said, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead and kill me. I would rather die than live like this. And so he ended up dropping the gun. He was so high on drugs. He passed out in the bedroom. I got a, I got a gar, I got a, a brown garbage bag and I put a pair of pants and, and a couple socks. I had my shoes on my feet and my, you know, my little jacket and stuff. And I, I ran down to the telephone and um, to call my only friend that I had and, um, that could help me at that time and um that knew billy and knew me and knew about us and what i was going through and i blacked out and so the next day i ended up she came and got me and we ended up going to the hospital and um i found out i was pregnant mm. so i'm 16 years old I'm pregnant. I had just gotten seriously beat the night before I was on drugs. Um, he was not happy. Um, I had no place to live. I had no money. I had no job. I had nowhere to go. So I ended up my sister, uh, my sister, Debbie, um, uh, I called her. She lived, she lived in where I'm at now um, another place in Florida. And, um, I came, she said I could come and live with her. So 
I, I did that and, um, it was just a really, really rough time. She was not, um, her and my grandmother, uh, that raised me were together on saying, you know, I was too young. I was, you know, just all these things and there was no encouragement and there was nothing I wanted. I wanted to keep the baby because I knew it would be the only thing that would love me. And I, needed that love so bad, but in the same token, I was living in so much fear that I didn't know what else to do. So I, I let other people make my decisions for me because if I made my decisions, I felt like I was on my own and I had no way to do anything on my own. And so I ended up having an abortion and, um, I went through a lot. Um, that was the worst nightmare of my life. Considering everything that I went through, that was the worst. Mm. Um, cause I remember, um, the lady, when I was in the room, um, I heard the instrument, uh, make the noise and I, I screeched out a, a squeal of agony, um, like, no. And the lady slapped her hand over my mouth and told me to shut up. And then when it was over with, she put me in another room with some other girls and just gave us crackers. And, mm -hmm. you know, I was crying and everything. And then <clears throat> um, something happened in me after that, that just caused me to become just empty. It was my I had not, I had nothing. It was like my soul had been taken out of me and it was, it was just gone. And, and in an instant of, you know, that half hour and it was just gone and there was nothing I could do. I could never get that back. And I hurt, I was filled with hurt and, and pain and, and agony. And I just, um, regrets and, um, I was bitter and I was, I, I was, I was angry at my grandmother. I was angry at my sister. I was, I was just angry at the world. And, um, you know, I was pointing fingers and, and just, it was, it was all the blame, you know, every, everybody, you know, and I, and I, I, I had made the choice, but I, you know, there is no buts, but, but that's, that was then. And I know that that after my experience and when I, um, when I came to know the Lord, that was the, the hardest thing that I had to deal with, um, was that because it was the only thing in my life that I didn't think he could forgive me for. Hmm. So Going forward, um, after that, I ended up living with my sister. I got away from, I got away from, in, out of that ab abusive relationship, and I started working. Um, I started working and uh, at this um, Scotty's warehouse, and I met this girl. Her name was Shannon, and um, I had gotten in so much trouble at that time that. Um, I didn't have a driver's license and um well what had happened with that was i um i was drinking a lot and going to bars and just you know in and out in and out um of jail and um drunk and disorderly and just different things like that and god really saved me from myself during those times when i would get caught because only he knows what would have happened if i hadn't have gotten caught but I was in and out of jail and in and out of jail. And I, um, the second time that I, I had my second DUI, they gave me community control and I ended up breaking that. And then when I broke my community control with my third DUI, I, um, didn't get out. I went straight to, to, um, they gave me, they gave me prison time. They gave me mm. two years at Lowell women's Institute. And so, uh, institution. And, um, but so I ended up, I ended up doing that time. I didn't do it all. I, um, I actually did do good in there. 
I got my GED and a trade, <laughs> mm. but I stayed myself and I was, I was good. And there was crusades that came in there, you know, gospel crusades that came in there. And I would go and, you know, I would go to the gospel crusades just to, um, you know, just to see if there was any good looking guys or anything in there, you know, and um, that kind of stuff. And, um, and, but God used a lot of that in my life too, to plant more seeds and more seeds and more seeds. So I got out on good behavior um, after a year, but I lost my license for uh, 10 years and um, I had a huge fine to pay. And so all that, you know, all that played out and everything. Um, so then when I got this job, um, I didn't have a car and I met this girl, Shannon, and she became good friend. And, um, <laughs> but I was still not after that, after that time that I did, I was, I was still not, I was still not, I was still doing the same things. It didn't change my heart. It just, you know, slowed me, slowed me down. It kind of gave me a slap on the wrist, but, um, it didn't change my heart. So there were nights that I wanted to go out and I would get, I would get ready to go out. And Shannon would come and she would stop me from going out and talk me into taking drives or, you know, we would, she would take me for an ice cream or, you know, these kind of things just to keep me from going out. Well, I noticed that she had a black Bible, a big black Bible on her seat and um, she drove older car, you know, and one day we were going to work and I asked her, I said, do you. I said, is that a Bible on your seat? And, and she said, yeah. And I said, I said, do you read it? And she said, yeah. And she used to play Petra music, like, you know, um, Christian rock. And I liked the rock, but I didn't really understand the words. And um, which after I became a Christian, I realized, you know, that was Christian, <laughs> Christian music she was listening to. But I started kind of avoiding her in a way. And um, and then I ended up uh, leaving my job at Scotty's and I got a job at Tropicana. And so this was when I was about 23, um, 23 years old. I was working at Tropicana and um, I started having really bad headaches um, I was working around the plant. I had different jobs in the plant and I would sit on the, uh, the hot end, they called it. And the bottles would come out and the, the spray would spray the bottles. And I would sit there as a filler operator and I was breathing in those chemicals and we didn't wear masks, um, or anything like that. So we were breathing in all those chemicals and, you know, there was no such thing as wearing masks or anything. So I, I breathed in a lot of toxics when I worked there. And, um, plus I cleaned them with, um, we'd go in with big hoses and, you know, spray it, spray down the filler and they used all kinds of cleaning chemicals, you know, and I didn't mm -hmm. wear a mask or anything. So I was just ingesting all this stuff into my body. Um, which, uh, you know, I, you can't compare that with drugs because it's all the same. It's all toxic, you know? So all this stuff was in my body and, you know, I, I just did what I had to do to, you know, to, to get through another day. And, um, and I, and, you know, I, I, I was, um, pretty, uh, I, I, I lived, I, I lived a pretty free life. Um, you know, I, I came and went as I pleased, you know, I, I had a lot of friends and, um, you know, I partied a lot and, um, you know, I just, I, you know, really, um, I really had a, a very, um, I would say it was a kind of a fun kind of wild, you know, um, upbringing in a way, well, when I became an adult, you know, I just didn't care really about, I cared what other people thought about me, but I didn't really care about myself. So what I did was when I would drink, I would drink to an excess and I would just get plastered. 
I, there was no cutting off point for me. So, um, as I was working at Tropicana, these headaches progressed and, um, I started missing, missing work. And, um, you know, I had some days that, that I could, that I was able to take, um, from working there, you know, a bit. And, um, so I wasn't penalized for that, but they became worse and worse. And my sister, Debbie, um, is a nurse. And, um, one day we were shopping and, um, my niece Jada, um, was with us and I lived with my sister and I helped her take care of Jada, you know, and kind of raise her, um, you know, in, in turn for some of my room and board and these kind of things. But the day we went shopping was the worst, the worst headache I ever, I ever had in my life. And, um, I ended up, um, I ended up, um, almost passing out and, um, I, I had to sit down and Jada went and got my sister. My sister came and she took me to the hospital emergency room. And, um, we ended up spending four hours in the emergency room and, and before, and by the time the doctor had gotten in there, he, I was, I was fine. My headache had gone away. And that's the way that they would come is they would come and and they would blast me and I'd have to lay down in cold rooms with cloths and everything and not talk. And then they would subside and just go away and then I'd be okay. Um, So anyway, this, my sister was like, um, something is wrong with her. You know um, we know something is wrong with her. So the doctor sent me for um, a CAT scan we went for a CAT scan and, um, I found out I had a brain tumor. At that point, I didn't even know what a brain tumor was. <laughs> I was, um, 25 and I was smoking cigarettes and I was drinking and I, you know, cussed like a sailor and, you know, just, um, didn't really know what I was up against. And so the day that, the doctor, the day that we went in to see my x-ray, um, at my neurologist office, he had my x-rays up on the screen and, um, my grandmother and my sister were there and he said, I want you in the hospital right away. Mm -hmm. And he wanted me to go in like right away. And so I was like, well, can I at least make some phone calls and, and go home and get some stuff, you know? And so anyway, he, I, the very next day I was admitted into the hospital. And, um, so this was the beginning of a journey that I never in my wildest dreams ever thought would ever happen to me in my life. Um, I started getting, uh, I started getting, um, cards were delivered, flowers were delivered, um, these cards and flowers were from people that I didn't know. Um, my room ended up looking like a funeral parlor. It was so full of flowers and, and I had so many cards and people telling me they were praying for me, um, from everywhere and every church. I didn't even know. Um, I didn't even know these people. I didn't, I never had heard of the the churches or anything, but, um, but I, you know, was thankful to have accepted the flowers. And, and I felt in my heart, I felt, um, I felt loved and I felt like these people love me and they don't even know me and they're sending me flowers and they don't even know me. And I didn't even know what was going to happen or how big it was going to be, but God did. Hmm. That was, and you were, diagnosed with a brain tumor and the uh, only way to resolve that was uh, with surgery. Yes. And so you were, I assume, frightened at this point, but you said you didn't really know the repercussions of having the brain tumor and you're still going to, you're still destined for another surgery, but um, the doctor had scheduled you for surgery and then something happened uh, that changed your life. Yes. Yes. Um, 
when the day they came for me for my surgery, um, they prepped me and everything and got me ready and took me up um, and uh, let me just, I want to go just a little bit back um, because before this, before this happened to me, um, there were times in my life with everything that I, that I was going through with the drugs and, and the alcohol and the, the abandonment um, from my mom and dad and, uh, you know, just the, the hurt and the anger and all the things that I had inside and, and all this, um, I was, I actually, um, uh, f- a few times, um, I was self, I self sabotaged myself. I was a cutter. And when I was, when I was in jail and juvenile home, I would, I would, I would just, um, carve into my skin and um, I would just carve into my skin and, and it would hurt and I didn't care. And I would just carve into my skin. And um, I just was like, I couldn't get myself. I couldn't get my, the inside of myself out, if that makes any sense. It was like, I just, I was like clawing. It was like I was clawing inside myself to get out of what, the situation that I was in and I could never do it. And so, um, I was, I was, I was a suicidal mess is what I was. And, um, Mm -hmm. so, but God knew all this. So with me getting this brain tumor, um, it just, it shocked everybody. And, um, and I, I didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't know the magnificent, I didn't know the, the, um, I didn't know the, the, the bigness of it. I I can't think of the word. It was just huge. And I can't think of the word, but, or a word, but, um, it was, um, it was just, it was just too big. And so, um, when they came for me in the morning, when they prepped me, Um, I went up and I remember, I remember going up to, um, to the operating room and they, um, you know, they talked to me a little bit and everything. And then, and then, um, they, they proceeded to put me under and, um, so I was under, um, it was October the 10th, uh, 1988 is when I had my surgery and, um, uh, so my room was filled with flowers and people were praying for me. I was in the operating room and, um, it was a 14 hour surgery, um, they operated on me for 14 hours. Um, but during this time when I was under anesthesia, um, it was like my spirit was lifted up into the heavenly realm that Paul says in the Bible, you know, he didn't, he was in, um, he was in the, he was, there's a, he was in the third heaven. He didn't know if he was where he was at, but he was, he knew he was in the third heaven. We have the, the, ele- the elements here and then in the, in the sky, and then there's the heavenly realm. So that's the third, that's the third, he- that's a third realm. And, and that's where I know I, I was at was in the third realm um, because um, I was lifted up in, I was lifted up in the most magnificent place that I've ever been in my life. I saw colors that were indescribable. I had peace like I never knew. I felt love that 
I never had before. And I was like, my thoughts in my, it's like my thoughts were crystal clear. There was nothing in the way. And I was just, I was in this beautiful place. I was in this beautiful place and there was nowhere, nowhere on this earth have I ever seen or been or could be because I know it was heaven. I know God gave me a glimpse of heaven and I stayed in that place. God has no time, but for 14 hours, I was just being, I was in this place being like ministered to like, like my, the, the doctors were operating on my head, but God was operating on my heart and mm. he was doing miraculous things mm. while I was in this heavenly place. And so because of the fact, I think now that Jesus and the word of God had been planted in my heart, they were starting to be watered and they were starting to grow. And um, when I was in this place, I was being comforted and I know that no one was holding my hand or tapping my hand as if to say, everything's okay. Everything's going to be okay. But I felt a, and I don't know if this was physical or if it was in the spirit, but I felt a physical tap like slowly on my hand you know, and, and here I have this physical sheet over me and they're operating on my brain and my arms are under the sheet. So the, the doctors or nurses could not be holding my hand nor touching me. And I feel this tapping, comforting feeling on my hand as if to say, it's going to be okay. Everything is going to be okay. So then I came to, and when I came to, it was as if my whole life had changed. <laughs> mm. It was like, it was like I was filled with joy. I was filled. Wow. Filled with just the peace of God that I never had ever. Yeah. It says my internet. I'm praying. Uh, uh, go on. Go ahead, Linda. Okay. Yeah. So that was my wonderful experience from God. And my mom, my mom was there. My sister was there. Um, my mom, I had held so much unforgiveness so much in my heart towards her. Um, I didn't love her like I should have. I actually um, felt like I hated her many, many times. And we fought a lot. And I forgave her for all that she did in her discipline towards me. Um, I forgave her for all her hurtful words. I forgave her for letting us go as as a child letting me go i forgave her for everything and i realized that forgiveness isn't just letting them off the hook forgiveness is setting myself free god gave me he forgave me for everything that i ever did anything i ever did in my past in my, you know, in my future, anything that I, that I, that I ever did in my life, he forgave me 
I had to forgive others, but I didn't know all this until I started reading the Bible and progressing in my Christian life. Um, it just wasn't an immediate impact that that experience had on my life. And, mm -hmm. and through that, um, and through that, we, I can get to more, to more detail. I want to just give you a chance to speak. <laughs> no, that it's amazing. Linda. um, so while you were having uh, brain surgery to remove the tumor for 14 hours on the operating table, uh, the Lord, God was performing heart surgery on you, spiritually speaking. Yes. And you were transformed on yes. the OR table while you were being ushered into this third heaven, which is uh, the resident place of God in heaven. As you said, Paul talked about the third heaven. Many of us have had experiences in this uh, in the third heaven when we have uh, had our afterlife or near-death experience and and that transformed you i mean there's nothing no other explanation for it uh, having gone through this 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 cataclysmic yes. sudden transformation no. uh after you were after you uh, awoke from the anesthetic and started recovering well when i was when uh when i was when I was in the spirit in heaven, um, the, the most important thing that I left out is that the colors that I saw were more beautiful than a rainbow. And I wanted to include that because there's a scripture that I found that backs this up. Okay. Um, in Revelations 4, 3, it talks about the circle of a rainbow and um it's around the throne of god okay so mm -hmm. it wasn't like i saw god sitting on his throne or that i saw jesus you know or anything like that it was that i know without a shadow of a doubt that that's where i was i was around the throne of god the the bible talks about um i looked up the the um the interpretation for um for the for revelations three i looked up um it the it says um a rainbow around the throne is the brilliant light emanating from the throne resembled a rainbow of emeralds hues um a seal and token token of his covenant so god was making a covenant god made a covenant you know he made his covenant like to Abraham and to his people and to Israel, you know, he, God, we have a new covenant. So he was making his covenant with me and I was making my covenant with him. And, and, um, he did that. I learned later through, through the blood of Christ. Hmm. So amazing. So absolutely amazing. And that's and what, how I came to know him was through the brain tumor and you were having um in the spirit you were with god and watching beholding the throne and yes you cited the scriptures that uh know the same experience that you had with the rainbow and the multicolors and the vividness of those colors and all of that um you had gone into this uh thinking that god was angry at you now how did you come out of this that god was literally my heavenly father full of love and mercy and kindness and compassion and um, acceptance, forgiveness, just complete and total opposite. Just set me free. All the chains were broken. All my chains were broken. And I was set free. I was just set free. The Bible talks about that too. It says when yes. when uh says when Jesus set you free, you're free indeed. And so when I had when a a man when I was in the hospital came to me that I used to work at Tropicana. And his name was Johnny, a little guy. And he brought me a Bible. 
and told me about Jesus after my surgery. And I knew exactly, I just knew in my heart it was true. He didn't have to convince me or anything. I just knew it was true. And, you know, he showed me where to start reading and I was like a sponge. So, you know, it just, God filled my life. He filled my life. He, he um, filled me with the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, um, he took my stony heart and made it flesh. You know, he took my, put my feet upon in Psalms and put my feet upon the rock, you know, that I would proclaim, proclaim his goodness and his name, his goodness and his name to the, to every generation, to all the generations, you know, to my children, to their children, um, you know, God has done so many great things in my life. He saved me. He healed me. He healed my mind. You know, he healed me. He broke my chains. He, he, he delivered me from drugs and alcohol and sin and death and hell. You know, he saved me from all that. And just at the gratitude and because he gave me life, I give him mine completely and totally. And he's given me wonderful, wonderful, wonderful friends and family and support and encouragement. He's provided for me all these years. He's given me two wonderful, beautiful boys that are now 24 and 28, replaced them with not just one, but two mm. for the one I lost that I know I'll meet again in heaven because I believe all babies go to heaven yeah. and um, because God has mercy and babies don't know. And I believe that with all my heart, I'll meet my baby in heaven. And he blessed me with two beautiful children. And um, I was, I was married for 17 years and then I suddenly became a single parent. And um, so my boys are raised now and um, I raised them in the church and they know the way um, they make their choices. And uh, but God is amazing. He's, he's full of grace. You know, there was no more, um, there was no more guilt. He took my fears away. Um, shame. I had no more shame. You know, we all struggle with these things on occasion, but the word of God can put that back in place, you know, and I'm a living testimony for his glory that he can do anything. He can change anybody's life. He could do anything, he, anything he wants to do. Don't box him in. <laughs> mm. God is God. And the only thing God can't do, and that's lie. He's a mm. God of truth. He's a God of justice. He's a holy God. And he is the only one that can change a heart. Well, you're a living testimony of that fact, Linda, that that is uh, so true. I mean, no amount of counseling or, or psychotherapy or <laughs> any, any treatment uh, can, can transform a person like you were transformed uh, with your experience in heaven with, uh, with God. Now you had, um, subsequent to, the, to this, you had multiple surgeries. In fact, you have one coming up uh, soon, don't you? Yes, I have. Um, I have had many more surgeries since then. And um, but I do want to say that the, uh, the the last one that I had was um, actually uh, it started um, the diagnosis started in November of last year. And I had my surgery in March. But during the time of my waiting for that surgery, 
I literally didn't think I was going to make it. And I was just, just at God's mercy again, of course, and wanting his will to be done in my life because I didn't see a way that anything was going to be able to help me. I was at my end with doctors. I was at my end with, um, with, um, you know, um, plastic surgeons. I was at my end. I couldn't, I couldn't find any doctors really that could help me and do what I needed to have done. So I was ready to, I was ready for. Linda. He used, yes. he used my experience, the, what I had, what I saw, I lived in that moment continuously praising him, thanking him, not knowing what was going to happen, but trusting that he, he is good and he is loving and kind and he was going to provide a way. And whether it was from this, from, from this time uh, and this day and, and if, whether it was from here to there or whether it was from here to another surgery, I was totally, I'm, I'm, I'm totally his. So he made a way and I did have surgery. Um, but it was only, um, like a temporary fix because I didn't want to go back to a big hospital far, far away, like John Hopkins in Baltimore. I had been there five times and I just didn't want to, I didn't want to fly back again by myself and be away from my family and friends. So I chose to go to Tampa and they did a procedure that um, they corrected something that was going on, but they didn't totally fix it. So now what they corrected is starting to happen again. So I'm on, I, with much prayer and um, a lot of research throughout a couple years from having needs that I was in preparation and I didn't really know, but um, I've, the Lord has opened up doors for me to go to New York, Mount Sinai, which I've learned that Mount Sinai is another name for Mount Horeb, which was the mountain that God gave Abraham. I mean, yeah, God gave Moses the 10 commandments on. <laughs> right. So it's all, it's also, um, it's also awesome. I mean, I just, it's like my life is an adventure, even though all this is happening to me, even though I've had to go through all these brain surgeries and everything, and I've had to go through all this suffering and everything. It's like, it's an adventure. I, it's like, I look forward to what he's going to do next. I get to minister to people in the hospital. I get to talk to, I get to talk to, um, you know, the, the people who come in to pray for you. And when I was in Tampa, uh, 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 a minister came in to talk with me and I shared, I shared my testimony with her and, and prayed with her and everything. And then, um, when she was on her way out, she told me she was a rabbi. <laughs> so I had planted some seeds in her life Wow! and didn't even know it. So tremendous, Linda, this is <laughs> The transform the transformation that you experienced, uh, being in heaven with the Lord and being exposed to His love, uh, is is very exceptional, and uh, we thank you so much yeah, for sharing. We do want to pray for you, uh, and I ask our listening and viewing audience that uh, you join join me in praying for Linda that. We ask in the name of uh, Jesus, Yeshua, uh, that uh, this forthcoming surgery would be successful, that there would be healing that would be uh, upon her, and that uh, you would be with the uh, surgeons, uh, that there would be complete restoration uh, of, of what, uh, what was damaged or lost uh, and Lord, we, we thank you and praise you that even as we pray thing, that uh, you have established it according to your word as you've spoken, whatever we pray, believing 
it is established. We know that you are with, uh, with Linda and will be with the surgeons and, uh, and we thank you for, uh, her healing in advance in Jesus name. So Linda, no, thank I, I thank you so much for that, Randy. And I have absolutely no fear because mm. I know he goes before me and I know he paves the way. And I know if we, when we make mistakes, if our road is crooked, he can make it straight and he'll always work things out for the best and provide and, and be the God who he says he is loving and merciful. Yes. And he's most of all my everlasting father. Mm. <laughs> he's yes. King, my everlasting father. He replaced the lost father that you had with a father, the heavenly father who is the consummate love. Uh, the name that uh, is referenced for God uh, is love in the Bible and uh, the book of John. And uh, again, thank you so much, Linda. This is truly a story of transformation and of meeting uh, the Heavenly Father and a change of heart What was a uh, that happened on an operating table for 14 hours with the Lord in, uh, in heaven. So... Again, thank you so much, Linda. Thank you, Randy. It's been a blessing. Likewise. And God now, bless everybody. Well, yeah, thank you for that blessing to our audience and as well. So uh, the great news is, beloved of the Lord, is if you are in Christ Jesus, be of good cheer because Amen. heaven is in your future. Take care. Amen. And God bless. Thank you. You too, Randy. God bless. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.